Right, this is, uh, we're continuing what we learned <clears throat> yesterday and the day before. <clears throat> this is a speech that the Lubavitcher Rebbe gave in <clears throat> Tavshin Nun Beit, which translated into uh, American terms is 19, the end of 1991. <clears throat> and it's talking about, <clears throat> as the Rebbe always talked about, but especially you're talking about Mashiach. And the main thing of Mashiach is that everything is going to be new. It's going to be a new world. Everything will be new. But what does it mean it's going to be new? The, the trees are going to grow from, from up to down or down. Something will come from heaven. And then <clears throat> what the, the, the law of gravity is going to be changed. And what, the people will have uh, you know three noses instead of two. What does it mean it's going to be a new world? What does it mean? <clears throat> so says the Rebbe, the meaning of a new world is that everyone's going to see that everything is brand new all the time. Everything is constantly being renewed. <clears throat> and we'll see that God is renewing it. <clears throat> so the, the stability of the world will be God. Everyone will see that <clears throat> <clears throat> everything that exists is being created from God and from God's love. <clears throat> everything. So everything will be brand new, brand new. So the Rebbe gives the example of the moon. The reason the Rebbe gives the example of the moon is because this speech was given on the last Shabbat of the month of Cheshvan, and the first, in, in, introducing the first day of Kislev. And in Judaism, the first day of the month is the moon is just beginning to be revealed. It's this little sliver. And the last day of the month, and the moon isn't there at all. It's dark. <clears throat> so even though that it's true that the moon is always there, it's just a new revelation. But nevertheless, that's called new. And we're going to get to this in a moment, like a birthday. When a child is born, it's a brand new thing. But the child already existed in its mother's womb, and it was even completely formed, you know, days before. <clears throat> days, I don't know exactly, I'm not such an expert in what it is, but I mean, at least a week before the baby comes out, it was already complete, right? And sometimes they can induce <clears throat> um, uh, um, birth, and they can delay birth, they can, so it can come out a little bit earlier. So what's the big deal of a birthday, right? The child was already there. But th that that comes from being concealed to revealed, that's a big novelty. It's the same thing with the moon. It's a big novelty. <clears throat> That it can be revealed from <clears throat> nothing to something. And the same thing is with the world. Same thing is with the world. The that we see in the world, we don't see the creator. And the creator is there. Certainly is. But it's concealed. And then when it comes revealed, that's called br being brand new. Brand new. So that's the whole idea of Mashiach. Something is going to happen that's going to be <clears throat> brand new. It's going to be a tremendous change is going to be like being born, but nothing essentially is really going to change. I mean, it's going to be just revealed what was concealed before. The godliness of the world, the true purpose of the world. <clears throat> okay. So, Matsinu, Midrashi, Chazal, I, I gave you the example in the, in the class we just had a couple minutes ago. And then you find some old picture, right? And, and uh, you're going to throw it away, a piece of, you know, the, in, the, in the newspapers, old newspapers for like 50 years ago, 50 years ago. And you find an old picture and you're going to throw it away. And someone says, hey, what's that picture? And he looks and says, wow, that picture, <clears throat> that's a genuine Renault or, or whatever it is. What's his name? Gagan or someone. That picture is worth like $15 million, right? That picture is worth $15 million. That all you treat the picture totally different afterwards. The same thing with the world. That world, what are you doing? The world that's made of God. God is making the world. Look, it's got a signature on everything. You treat the world differently. Okay. So, Matsya, we find, if we can add also this connection of the future redemption of the Jewish people. Mashiach coming and revealing who the Jews really are. Now, who are the Jews really? The Jews are the sons of God. The Jews are called B'nai B'chor Yisrael, the first the chosen first ones of God. Moses went into Paro. God told Moses, go into Paro and say, 
you're, you're keeping my sons, my chosen ones, in captivity. Right? This is I'm giving, bringing a message from God. God says the Jews are his sons. Bni, his sons. It says his son, firstborn. You're keeping him in captivity. <clears throat> so that's who the Jews really are. What does that mean? We, what does it mean? And the Tanya explains it. We don't feel it. In the future, we will feel it. We're the servants of God. We're, we're servants. You feel that we're servants. Down deep, every Jew feels it. Down deep, every Jew feels it is. We're the wife of God. The whole book of the Song of Songs is the Jewish people are the wife of God. We're married. God loves us. <clears throat> you feel this? In the future, we'll feel it. Everything will be special. It'll be every instant will be million dollars. But yes, we'll see if we can add in the connection to the redemption of the Jewish people to the birth of the moon. <clears throat> like it says, the Jewish people, they are going to be renewed like the moon. At first glance, it's not understood. Metzina, we find in the Midrash Chazal, let me get my pointer over here. We find in the teachings of the rabbis, Sheshlemusam Shal Bnei Israel, that the completion, the wholesomeness of the Jewish people in the time of King David and King Solomon was something like the fullness of the moon. Halavana Berishon, Halavana Berishon Shal Nisan Matchil Leir. In the beginning of the month of Nisan, the moon begins to shine. And the bigger it becomes until Tetvav Yomim, until the 15th day of Nisan. That's Passover, when the Jews got out of Egypt. <clears throat> it, the discus shalo mit male, the moon gets filled. And also the Jewish people, Tetvav Dor, 15 generations from Abraham until King Solomon, Abraham began to shine since it came Solomon, King Solomon, Shlomo. Shlomo HaMelech, he built the first temple, right? Nitmale discus shalavana, the moon became full. Shneamar, like it says, the Yeshav Shalomo, the King Solomon said, Al Kisei Hashem LaMelech, he sat on the throne of God as a king. Kaima Siora Beshlemusa, it says the moon was full. <clears throat> okay, cave and since Shagula meeted since the the true redemption by means of the Mashiach. And Mashiach is going to come from the house of King David. And he's going to come from the seed of King Solomon. He's going to be a direct relative of King Solomon. That's what it says in the Mishnah, in the Rambam, says in, the, in his Mishnayot, he said, So therefore, the Jewish people will be When Mashiach comes, the Jewish people, they will be in the ultimate, how do you say, completion. The, the, the Oh, more, even more, even more than it was in the time of King David and King Solomon. In the kind of time of King David, especially in the time of King Solomon, in the kind of time, in the time of Shlomo, Shlomo is King Solomon. In the days of King of Shlomo, his name was Shlomo because there was peace in his time. The reason that there was peace in his time was because all of the enemies of the Jews, the war, warlike, what is it, the warring nations, that they loved war and they loved to conquer, they loved to kill, and they loved to be in the thick of battle. That was like really, you know, being alive to them. In the time of King David and, and Shlomo, it says that there was peace in the world, but the, the it was the peace was there because everyone respected Shlomo. <clears throat> everyone respected Shlomo. Everyone was in awe of Shlomo, and they realized that they could benefit if they listened to what he said. King Solomon would give him blessings. So therefore, in those days, there was peace in the world. But when Mashiach comes, it'll be a much lasting and internal peace. In the days of King Solomon, the, the peace in the world was there because Solomon was there. Shlomo. As soon as Shlomo wasn't there, the peace went away. The idea of the Mashiach is going to be that <clears throat> the world won't be dependent on the Jewish people to realize that God exists. Everyone will realize it on his own. I mean, after all, God is creating everybody. The same God that's creating the Jews is creating the non-Jews, right? <clears throat> it's creating everything. It's creating the animals also, but the animals can't have no responsibility. 
<clears throat> so the whole world, the whole idea of Mashiach is that this peace and revelation of God that was in the time of King Solomon that made everyone respect Solomon and Shlomo and wanted to come close to him and do what he said because they would benefit from it, that same godliness is going to be inside of everyone. And everyone automatically, the non-Jews automatically will want to do the seven Noahide commandments, but they want to do what's right. Automatically. We'll get to that. That's what it means. The moon will be full. <clears throat> the moon the moon is the receiver. It'll be filled with godliness. Okay. In the time of the Mashiach, Shayach, Matim, Yoter, <clears throat> then it's in the time of the Mashiach, it's relevant to say, Miloy Vashlemot, Betachlet Vashlemot. Then everything will really be complete. Mashiach. Od Yoter, even more than it was in the time of King David. Oh, I'm going back to the same line. I'm never going to finish it this way. Here we go. The Miloy Vashlemot, oh, Alavana, of the moon. <laughs> So when Mashiach is going to come, it's going. Then things are really going to be full. <clears throat> it won't just be like the birth of the moon on Rosh Chodesh. Shezeh Ata that now Nitchadesh Or that all of a sudden you see something new, Alavan in a way of Nakuda Bilavad. The first day of the month, there's only just a little sliver of light. <clears throat> so why do we compare the future redemption? to the new month. When there's a new month, there's just a little sliver of light. That's something like King David and Saul and Shlomo. A sliver of light. The whole world saw that there was God and that God really cares about them and loves them, but they saw it through Shlomo. It was just a sliver of light. When Mashiach comes, then the whole world will feel godliness. It won't be like the new month, like the new moon. So why do we compare the future redemption to the new moon? and won't be incomparable to the full moon in the middle of the month. Then the moon is full. Oh, if so, we should compare the coming of the Mashiach, not to the first day of the month, to the birth of the month, but we should compare the coming of the Mashiach to the middle of the month, when the moon is full. But we don't. We compare it to the beginning. Why? How much more so shall be or Lavana in the future when it will be in the days of the Mashiach, Shiyeh, or Levana, this is the moon, won't just be full. The moon will be like the sun, like it was before it became small. It says when God created the world, if you look over there on the fourth day of creation, so it said God created the two big lights. The big light he made for the day and the small light he made for the night. What, what, the second, in the beginning it said there were two big lights. And in the end it says that one was big and one was small. So it says, for whatever reason it is, Rashi brings it that God told the, the, the moon to make itself smaller. Originally, the moon was also an illuminator. And now the moon just became a receiver. It says, in the future, the moon is going to be also an illuminator. It'll be the source. What does that mean? The world is the receiver. That's like the moon. God is the giver. That's like the sun. Now the world receives. This is in the future. The world itself will shine with godliness, just like the, just like God himself. We'll see that this world is the most important to God, more higher than the heavens that, that shine godliness. This world is going to be pure God. What does that mean? I don't know. But it's not going to be like the first day of the moon where there's just a little sliver. Well, the Hosef and Tehran, that, that this question that we're asking, what question? That the future redemption should be compared to the full moon, not the beginning of the moon, the new moon. And here we're comparing the future redemption to the new moon, to the little sliver. Why? This, this question stresses even more the connection to the Rosh Chodesh, the first day of Kislev. We're not just talking about a regular <clears throat> month. At the beginning of every month, there's just this little sliver of the moon. We're talking about the first day of the month of Kislev. Kislev is covering over Lamed Vav. We said Lamed Vav, this is like the six emotions of God Times six, a full re revelation. Lo, this thing of lo, lo I'm at 36, this indicates not on the beginning of revelation. Like we said before, that's case Aleph. Rosh Hashanah says is covered over, the Aleph is covered over. But this is also the complete revelation. Like we said before, six times six. This is made when the full moon. So Kislev indicates on the fullness of God being revealed. What was Kis, what was covered over, was the 36, was the full revelation of God's <clears throat> personality, his emotions. The Loba Rega Sha'achre Ha'elam, the Kisoi Rega Mola, the moment it was born. 
and therefore we have to say that the future redemption coming that comes going to come through David, the King Mashiach, <coughs> that is compared to the Molid Halavana, to the first beginning, the new moon, not when the moon is full, somehow or other, this is stressing more, Shiesh Molid, the Chidush, Kam Bnei Gabi Miloy Vishlemos. Somehow or other, the first sliver of the moon is higher than the full moon. The full moon is going to be like, that's, that's comparable to the future redemption. The full moon, because everything's going to be full. And it says even more, the moon is going to be like the sun. It's going to be full. So that should be the metaphor for the future redemption, where everything's going to be full. It's not. The metaphor for the future redemption is the new moon. And there's just a little sliver. Why? It says it must be that somehow or other, this first sliver of the moon, this is more similar to the future redemption than anything. Gula Aditi Atida, and the future redemption is going to come by means of David, Mashiach, Tidgale will be revealed by the Jewish people this quality of the new moon. The thing of the new moon is renewal, revelation from nothing, like we're going to learn in a second. You even we can understand this, Behektem Abiur, by preceding, explaining what it means birth. Like a child, a baby. When a baby is born and when he becomes older. You do what's known. Mom or Godly Israel, the, one of the Tanayim was asked, when you pray, who do you pray to? said, I pray like a baby. I pray like a, a little baby prays. What does it mean like a baby? He's not talking about a, a first, first uh, fresh baby. But a little Jewish children, they're taught to pray. And they're taught God exists and they're taught to pray. And this begins when they're like two years old, maybe three years old at the most. So when they pray to God, they don't know anything, but they're praying. They know that God exists and that they're praying to him. Right, praying. So if you ever seen pictures of little children when they're praying, I mean, you can say that, you know, they were just taught to do it. And so that, <clears throat> but you can, if you look with a positive eye, you can see that they're praying with all of their being. They're crying out to God. They're praying to God, right? <clears throat> so it says, so it says in the Talmud, that there's, there's a, a, a long Hasidic discourse, which was written by the third Rebbe of Chabad, and it's called Shorsh Mitzvah Tatafila. It's it's written in the book called the uh, Derech uh, Mitzvah Techa by the third Rebbe of Chabad, the Tzamach Tzedek, third Rebbe of Chabad. And, and it's a very long, very very long, intricate, detailed expl uh, explanation of what God is and what we should be thinking about and what prayer is and how to arouse aspects of different aspects of our soul. But it's it revolves around. Who, when you're praying, who should you pray to? So one place it says like this, that when you pray, you should pray like a little baby. You're just praying to God. Another place it says, why is it that people pray and they're not answered? Because they don't know any of the aspects of God. They don't know the names of God. You have to have an idea when you're praying to God, the power of God, it's a little bit different than when you pray to the kindness of God, when you pray to the beauty of God, right? This is all aspects of God. You're praying to only one God. But if you don't know the aspects, then your prayers aren't answered. This is one second. It just says that you're not supposed to do. You're supposed to pray like a child. Which are you supposed to do? So the answer is both. Both. Let's examine what it means to pray to God like a baby. <laughs> Since the, the child doesn't know about any levels of godliness, <clears throat> all these spherot and aspects and we said tzimtzum and lights with b b b beams, with concealments. The baby doesn't know anything. Right? It's a, a two-year-old child. You tell him, pray to God. He's certain that God exists. He's certain that God wants him to pray. So he prays. <clears throat> so his prayer, he's praying to God himself. <clears throat> How God is above any of these names or aspects or descriptions. Mahuto v'atzmuta mamash. God's real essence. So it could be this little child, he doesn't even know that God took the Jews out of Egypt. 
He doesn't know that God is creating the world. He just knows that God exists and you should pray to him. So he's praying really to the essence of God. turn a little bit deeper. In some ways, there's an advantage, something better about a child praying over a big tzaddik praying. God will be Israel. Shemit Palel, the dad so the tino. And the one who said this, I don't remember, it was a Bayan rabbi, I don't remember, but these tremendous genius rabbis, they had the power to raise the dead. They were, they were uh, uh, and of tremendous spiritual uh, uh, levels uh, and connection to the creator. These, he says, how do you pray? He said, I pray like a little child. Says the Rebbe, really, a child praying is better than his prayer. Is better. Why? Because God of Israel, a great genius Jew, a tremendous tzaddik that can do all sorts of miracles and raise the dead. But when he prays to God, since he knows and understands things about the Sfirot and all these different levels, he has to negate all of these terms and spiritual levels, a love, a low lamidotov. To pray directly to God like a child. So a, a great genius, holy tzaddik, he can only pray like a child. <clears throat> a child is a child. <laughs> He's not like a child. He is a child. So <clears throat> when a great genius, holy Kabbalist prays to God, so he has to remember that he's praying to God. He's not praying to any aspects. By means of this, that a person thinks that all of these levels that he has and these aspects of God, they are only just what's called Tori Shlila. They're what's called negative descriptions of God. What do you mean? When we say God is kind, that's negative. What's negative about God being kind? When we say that God is powerful, that's a negative thing. What's it negating? What was it? That's positive. It says, no, 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 no. You don't understand. <clears throat> That we are saying to God that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Inyan Yochol Shenemar Alav Yisprech, who Mafshit Mimenu Yisprech, Kol Mashu Hepech Hayacholot. Okay, let, let, let me explain what he's saying. If we say that God is powerful, so what are we trying to say? That we understand a little bit about God. We understand about God. No, but God is powerful. We see the, 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 the sunrise, amazing. You see the waves of the sea. Is that, 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 that's the power of God. He says, no, it's not so. <clears throat> what we see is that God is not weak. But what you're seeing, that's not the power of God. That's just a little small ray, a little example. But when we say, but God, you are powerful, what does it mean? That you have no weakness. When we say, God, you are infinite, what does it mean? It means that, God, you are not limited. But we don't understand what God is. We can only understand what God is not. God is not limited. God is not a person. <clears throat> God is not cruel. God is not... So we can only understand aspects of God, and even those aspects are not really understanding what God is, we're just saying that this shows that God is not limited. God is not weak. God is not mean. God is not... <laughs> we say God is wise. God has a will. <clears throat> By means of this, What we're doing is we're removing from God anything that's the opposite of wisdom. When we say, God, you are wise, we're not saying we understand God's wisdom. We're saying, God, you are not foolish. God, you know everything. But what God is, we can't understand. But what we can do is narrow it down. Narrow it down. <clears throat> From level, level to level. the <clears throat> Eloy And level after level. So if we say that God is infinite, so it means that God is not finite. So how can there be a world, let's say, of a silut? Isn't that indicating that God is Finite, we can define him. It says, no, 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 that that we're saying that God is the world of Atsilut means that he's not any of the lower levels. He's not any of the lower levels. He's this level of Atsilut. But really, that doesn't mean that that's what he is. 
It's not what he is. It's just showing the level of Atsilut that's infinite. That's infinite. So it's coming to show that God is not finite. Then when we see that there's something above the world of Atsilut, so we say, okay, now we realize that what we thought before is not right. What is yes right? We don't know. But all we know is that anything we were thinking about God in the direction of being weak or the direction of being limited or the direction of being cruel, that that's wrong. Ad shetachli yediyah to ultimately, what we, the more you understand about God, the more you realize you don't really know what reality is. You just understand aspects. You can reach the conclusion. That we cannot understand godliness. So that's the idea of idolatry. What's idolatry? You try to put God in a box. <clears throat> you try to put God into a thing, a person, a creation. Right? <clears throat> that's idolatry. The Jewish people are the sons of God. You can't worship a Jew. You can't pray to God. You're not allowed to. You can't pray to a thing. You can't pray to the world of Atsilut. You can appreciate God through the world of Atsilut. You can request from people to help you. You can request people to help you to understand God. But you can't say a person is God. Kevin and Shemigia, this... Why? Because no matter how holy you get, holiness just shows that God is not that. He's something bigger than that. <clears throat> Since you reach to that by means of what shlila, therefore you have to negate, you have to eliminate all the previous ideas you had in order to understand something about God. All right, when we say that God is infinite, that eliminates any sort of picture we might have of what God is. So Hari So all the names of God are really not what God is. It's just showing what God, eliminating all the other things which contradict what this name it, 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 it describes. Shalomayla me called Darga Tor So therefore, God Himself is above any of these descriptions. Ladad Zatinok as near so that it's felt by Him Guva Iloi Vahafla. All of a sudden, you can start realizing the highness of what God is, that God is not limited to any description. This feeling, the shlilas dargos atorim. So therefore, a big tzaddik, he feels how great God is by eliminating anything that he thought was God before. So that's the thing of Kabbalah, right? What's the good thing about Kabbalah, knowing things about God? Because without that, you might think that like the world does. God is a person. You can worship the Son of God. You can worship the Spirit of God. You can worship the, the aspect of God. And in, in the Hindu religion, they have all these different aspects of God with 70 hands, with this and this. And these are all spiritual levels, which they all exist, but they're not God. You're not allowed to worship them. So by means of learning Kabbalah, things like that, so you start to realize Wow, that what I thought was God. That's just the world of, y of Yetzira. <clears throat> so Yetzira, so that, no, now I understand what God is. He says, no, 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 that you thought that was God. That's not, that, that was the world of Yetzira. Now you're understanding the world of Bria. <clears throat> oh, that's what God is. He says, no, 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 God's not the, that you thought that God was just infinite. That's <clears throat> not so. God is not infinite the way you thought. God is, negate that. God is higher. So you're constantly removing any misconceptions that you might have about God. That's what big tzaddikim do. Masha'inki and Tinoch, which is not the case, a little baby. Kevin she'en Musa, because he doesn't have any idea of all these different levels of godliness. He doesn't have to negate any of these levels. And when he prays to God, he's praying to God himself. She'enu begeru dargas tor maila. Atzmus is the essence of what God is. So if you come to a little child and say, you know, this God has all this, there's different, different names of God. There's the name of, of, of Elohim, that's Gavura. And the name of this, this is Chesed. The child will say, what, you, you mean God has like arms and legs? Why? Well, I didn't know those things. <clears throat> It'll confuse the child. God's essence. God's essence, he doesn't have any arms, he doesn't have any legs. God's just pure godliness. So it's, in some ways, the child is better. Of course, <clears throat> there's, there's a certain disadvantage to that is that it's easy to knock it down. The child hasn't got any real hold on it, on what it is, right? If his teacher, his great teacher says, no, you know, God is, is, is uh, he only does good things, only kind things. Says, well, how did all these bad things happen in the world? And I heard that people are dying. 
says that, that God is only good. So the child who thinks, well, God is good. Maybe <clears throat> that bad things happen that's not from God. Maybe it's from something else. The child will get all confused. You won't understand. So therefore, you have to understand these lower aspects of God in order to have a ladder. To But at the end, the ladder brings you to the awareness that the little baby had in the first place, that, that God is everything, that God just is pure existence. <clears throat> so therefore, when a child prays, he prays to God's essence. He doesn't even call God by the name of Atzmus Amahus. But what does he call God? He just calls God Hashem, the name. That's why some people ask, you know, why don't you write God's name when you write, you write G dash D. Why? The reason is that you don't think that God is a thing, that God is a spirit, that you're praying to something, the highest thing there can possibly be, the creator that created everything. He's the big creator that creates everything, but he himself is a thing. So therefore you don't write his name or you write just Hashem, the name. Why do you call God the name? Right? You call the God the name. Because all that we can refer to God is there's these different names. We have to pray to God. I mean, God is we're we're here, we're praying to God. So it seems that God is something separate, right? We're praying, we're calling him God. So we say, no, we're calling him the name. Why are we calling the name? Because behind the name is the reality. And anything we can call God is just a name. It's just a name. That we can't really describe what God is at all. Also, there's in Yiddish, they also call the Ebrister. Ebrister means the highest. <clears throat> what is it? Elyon. Ebrister means the highest one. No matter what level you can think of godliness, God is above that. He creates that. In a Kavana Tatinuk, the child doesn't want to explain that God is Ebrister, how high God is. Of God. No, Ki'im. Shinimsa Lamaila, whatever you think God is, God is above that. So when a child calls God the Abrister, the highest one, or he calls him Hashem, it doesn't mean we're trying to explain what God is. We're trying to explain what God is not. God is not anything that I think. God is above that. So God is the highest of high. Don't try to understand. Shapirusho Elyon, when it means that God is higher, means that his reality is more real that anything you can possibly mean, it doesn't mean that he's trying to call God some sort of a name, that he is the highest one. We're trying to, the child is trying to say that God is above, and you cannot possibly grasp what his true existence is. Just that God is. The fact is, we can't really say that God is, that God exists, that God is a some sort of other a being. Why? Because these words also imply something. We've said it so many times, God doesn't really exist. God creates all existence. We have to use this, some sort of a term. So therefore, we have to use something. We've got to pray. It's a commandment. You have to pray to God. So who do we pray to? And so, so therefore, you have to use some sort of a term. Like the Rebbe said. Now, now, don't think that this limits God to being above everything. He's so incredibly far away, we can't grasp him. No. <clears throat> when we say that God is unlimited, it means he's not limited to being unlimited. <laughs> God is not limited to being removed from everything. Higher than everything. No. We say that God being unlimited means that he cares about every little detail in this world. Say one minute. God doesn't do that. God is way higher. So there, there you go. Now you have to negate that also. Whatever you think that God is, you're limiting it. That's why we have the Torah to tell us what how this unlimited, infinite God reacts to what we do. <clears throat> why that doesn't make any sense? Oh, that's God. It doesn't make any sense. That's our God. That's the God of the Jews. <clears throat> he creates everything. He's above the spiritual. He creates the spiritual. <clears throat> He's above any level you could possibly, God doesn't really exist, any type of existence that you can even call or imagine that God is above that. He creates it. But at the same time, God cares about every little atom and every molecule and every worm and every ant <laughs> in the world. What, what that? Okay, we didn't get to that second part yet, but that's what it's good. So all we can say about God is that he is, that he is. 
as a result from this, as a result from this, there's the difference between them, between the child and the genius holy tzaddik, and, and the level the, 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 the level and the existence of the person that's attaching to God. It's a godly Israel by a holy tzaddik, a genius, holy Jew that has served God his whole life, that he knows and understands the greatness of God by means of negating all the other levels that might limit God in some way. So his attachment to God is complete, is in a way of hafshata <clears throat> v'shlilat mitziyoto. It's a way of, so to speak, negation. He's negating anything that you might think God is. Shlilat havana, negating any sort of understanding that he had previously. When we say that God is infinite, it means that God is not anything finite, including the ideas of what you thought infinite was yesterday. That's also wrong. Until finally you get to the point where you think, one second, if God is really infinite and God really cares about everything in the world, so who am I serving over here? I'm serving God, which is infinitely, infinitely in love with me and with the world, cares about me, doesn't really exist. He's totally above my comprehension. I can't understand it at all. But if so, I'm, I, me, I'm being created. I'm being created by God who cares about me, loves me, and it's totally impossible to understand what God is, but he's, de he's demanding these things from me that I should do. Right? So it ends up everything that I do, I'm doing for God, which is totally above comprehension, totally above understanding. And in fact, even saying that God is above understanding, that's an insult to God. God is not even in the ca category of understanding. So my personal life that I live every single second has to be devoted to and is responsible to God, which is totally, infinitely, infinitely real. That I have no comprehension of it. That's called Mesir Nefesh. In other words, I have to give up all of my understanding to God. And one of the things I have to do, God commands me to do, is to try to understand Him. You have to try to understand. So, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit down and learn all the Kabbalistic books, <clears throat> like the Arizal. I'm going to know everything that the Arizal knew and all the deep secrets that the Arizal knew and everything that when you know all these deep secrets of God, what does it finally boil down to? That you do what God wants, you do all the commandments with total surrender to the Creator. I have no understanding what this is. I can explain any idea in Kabbalah that you want to the deepest sentences, the be esoteric ideas of the of Eitz Chaim, of the of, I can explain everything. But when it comes to what I actually, how do I live my life? I'm only be able to explain these things to you because that's what God wants. I don't understand it. And he's willing to give his life for God in a second. Everybody saying, oh, the great rabbi, the great rabbi. There's a famous story, and we'll just finish right here. Let's just, Masha Enkin, which is not the case, by a child that in the beginning, or who be gallows by a child, he's certain of God's existence above any sort of knowledge. He doesn't have to negate anything. This knowledge by a child so this becomes his whole being. Automatically, he's willing to do anything for God. It's our, this is everything that he does, how he eats, how he sleeps, how he blesses. And that's a child. There's a story, a very shocking, a very surprising story in Judaism, that in the time of the Arizal, there lived a very holy, great Jew. His name was Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Yosef, Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, and he was the same level of holiness as the Arizal. He was great in the revealed aspects of the Torah, law. And the Arizal was in Kabbal. They both lived in Sfat. They're buried one right next to the other, near the other in Sfat. And I think it's the son of the Arizal married the daughter of, of Rav Yosef Karo. Rav Yosef Karo is called Beit Yosef. Either his son or his daughter. Anyway, they, they, married, they married the children. So this Yosef Cairo, <clears throat> he had an angel that used to come and talk to him and give him uh, Torah ideas. And one day the angel came to him and said, good news, you're going to go to the land of Israel and you're going to be burned at the stake. You're going to die. And he was tremendously happy. I was going to die. And then the angel came back a little while later and said, listen, you did something that, that was, you, you, you lost your level. You lost your, your favor in God's eyes. You get second place. You're going to get first place. What's second place? You write the Shulchan Aruch. So I wrote this book called the Shulchan Aruch, which that's the basic law book of all Judaism, all Judaism. 
he lived about 400, 450 years ago. In time. Those 450 years, that's been the basis of Jewish life, the Shulchan Orach that he wrote for all the Jews, every Jew, every religious Jew. Every, Shulchan Orach. Everything. You want to know what's, what to do, what to think, what the, everything is in the Shulchan Orach. <clears throat> it's this book called the Shulchan, Shulchan Orach, means the set table. But it ends up that writing this Shulchan Orach was a second prize. That wasn't the first prize, it was a consolation prize. The main prize was is that he would give his life for God. Now, what, what, what benefit is that if he would give his life to God? He says, that's God's essence. God's essence is that every second of your life, you're doing it only because God wants. You're giving yourself over to God. That's called Masirat Nefesh. <clears throat> so by him, to give his life for God was the same thing as writing the Shulchan Aruch. I Writing the Shulchan Aruch was, you know, years, who knows, of tremendous effort and thought and working and remembering the, all the laws of the Torah and the old, uh, tremendous effort, and dying for God is one second. But so the answer is doing what God does doesn't make any sense because God doesn't make any sense. But on the other hand, he certainly does make sense. What was the consolation prize? To write this book, the Shulchan Aruch, which is only sense. It's only ideas that have to be proved and everything you have to, you can go back into the Gemara and see where his sources were. So it's all logic and understanding. So we see that God is not limited to being unlimited and unlimited. But who really gets this whole business is a child. A little baby, he's praying to the essence of God. No questions asked. No descriptions given. A child. That's something like the birth of the moon. That's something what Mashiach is going to bring. And that's what we're going to talk about, God willing, tomorrow. <clears throat> mm -hmm.